Hey there, and thanks for joining us today on Hay Talk with Massey Ferguson. I'm Jessica Williamson, Livestock and Forage Manager with AgCo. Hey, and I'm Matt LaCroix, Director of Marketing for Hestima Massey Ferguson and Massey Ferguson Hay Equipment. We're here to help you get the best hay possible. In this season on Hay Talk, we're diving even deeper, looking at how you can maximize your output, get the most from your equipment, and more. On this episode, we're looking into round bale silage. We're talking best management practices, why it provides superior livestock nutrition, what moisture levels you'll want to look for, crop types, and whatever else we might come across along the way. That's not all, because the topic of round bale silage is a two-parter, but you'll have to stick around to find out what's coming up in the next part. Stay tuned after the break. And welcome back from the break. We appreciate you joining us for Massey Ferguson Hay Talk. Today we're talking round bale silage. And just as the first question I want to start out with is why is round bale silage superior? Is it superior for livestock nutrition? Sure. So if we're comparing round bale silage to dry hay, um, if you caught our last episode, we talked a little bit about respiration. And one of the biggest things with round bale silage is we're going to be harvesting this at a higher moisture level. And so we'll get into some of the details of that in just a little bit. But we talked about respiration and how that crop is going to continue to respire as it lays in the field. So because we're harvesting this crop at a higher moisture level, it actually doesn't have as much time to respire or burn up all of those valuable carbohydrates as it lays in the field. So automatically, whenever it's baled, it's going to have a higher nutrient content compared to our dry hay. Another thing is the higher moisture forage is going to have less leaf loss as it goes through all of the different cycles of the harvesting process um, as we go through raking that crop and then baling that crop. If we're raking and baling a crop that's meant for dry hay, of course, we're going to get a lot of leaf loss, whether that's with a legume like alfalfa or clover or with a grass hay. So essentially what our goal is, is to bale this crop at a much higher moisture than what we would for our dry hay so that we can create an environment that's going to be conducive to anaerobic fermentation. So we want that higher moisture so that those microbes can then be converted into an anaerobic form or lack of oxygen. And then they can take those carbohydrates that are available and convert them into acids, which is a highly digestible um, form of energy for our ruminant animals. That's good. Good. So I'm going to throw you a little curveball here. Uh, Does it matter or is there are there different practices whether you're doing a grassy hay versus alfalfa silage or even take it even a step further into a corn silage so um yeah so it's important to understand what the basics of fermentation are or what is happening during fermentation and essentially that's going to be the conversion of the available sugars into acids so some of our crops are going to have a higher sugar content than others so if we're talking about a uh, cool season grass that is maybe past its optimal stage of maturity say we're talking about orchard grass and we weren't able to get in the field to cut it at the optimal time. It's already gone to seed. Um, It's starting to dry down. We're starting to get some of that regrowth underneath. Um, It's really not gonna have that sugar content that is essential for that really, really good fermentation. So it's important to think about that as we're going through and deciding how to harvest each of our crops. Alfalfa is, of course, going to have a high sugar content, but maybe not quite as high as some of our warm season annuals are going to have or like corn silage. So the really good thing about corn silage is it just has a ton of sugar, a ton of energy um, concentration in it. So we have a really good chance of a really stable, very good fermentation success just because of all of the available um, sugars that are in that crop. 
And so essentially, whenever we get that acid production, that's going to create a very stable environment for the microbes. It's going to create a very stable crop um, or forage type. And it's just a really, really good feed source. Because like I said, um, those animals are already they already have a fermentation vat in their bellies. They have a rumen. And so what they're doing is converting sugars or available energy into acid. And essentially, that's what's happening in that fermentation process. So as they're consuming this crop, it's a really available form of energy for these animals. Good deal. And before we jump into the next you know, question, one thing I do want to remind the audience is anytime you're doing silage baling, I would suggest always using a silage baler. Uh, some people think you can just take a, a, a normal round baler and take it out and bale silage. It's not always conducive. Uh, some of the items that are silage baler would or could have is uh, heavier bearings, uh, more rollers, heavier rollers, that kind of thing. Also, a lot of silage balers have uh, knives if you want to pre-chop the crop. Uh, that's another thing also that silage bellers will have. So it's not always the, the best practice to take a dry hay baler and run out into a, a you know, silage condition. And let's jump into the next thing is what is what makes the, the moisture levels that we call silage, right? So different parts of the world, they call uh, silage different moisture levels. So we're looking anywhere from 60s down to even, you know, 30 and so forth with baleage and that kind of thing. So what's the optimum if you could just go out into the field and say hey i want this moisture hey what's what's the perfect do you think uh i would say for most of our crops it's going to be anywhere from 45 to 60 percent moisture um if we get less than 45 percent there's still the possibility for fermentation. So if your hay dries down a little bit too long, so I always like to use this example, say your goal is to make dry hay, but up pops a thunder shower and you know in the next 12 to 20 hours you're going to get some showers on your hay so you're thinking about going ahead and baling this and making round bale silage out of it instead of dry hay so perhaps it's already dried down a little bit past that 45 percent moisture that's perfectly fine what we're going to suggest is adding a few more layers of film to that bale so that we can make sure that all of the oxygen is completely excluded. So if we're really talking about um, some of the best management practices for round bale silage production, first and foremost, we need to make sure that the oxygen is excluded from that bale as quickly as possible. That's going to give that crop the best fighting chance for the best fermentation possible. And so if you are a little bit drier or even above that 65% range, again, maybe we're fighting a rain, maybe you're just up against another time constraint, um, we're just going to make sure that we get more wrap than perhaps what you normally would if you're in that 45 to 60% range. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. So, you know, one of the items that you throw out sometimes in your discussions and stuff is TDN. Uh, total digestible nutrients and can you break that down and, and tell everybody what makes that up and and how that affects you know the the end goal right the end goal is right to have be more um, nutritious for the your herd and if you're in a milking situation of course that that uh, cow needs uh, good nutrition so can you break that down and tell us how that actually affects the end product Sure, absolutely. So TDN is total digestible nutrients, and it is a calculated analysis. There's many different formulas um, for TDN across different regions. Different labs may calculate it differently. Different nutritionists may prefer certain TDN calculations over others. But the basic premise of total digestible nutrients is taking a sum of all of the energy that's available within that crop from crude protein, fat, non-structural carbohydrates, or it may read as NSC on your forage analysis report, um, digestible uh, fiber components. So our digestible neutral detergent fiber, which is going to be the composition of all of the cell wall components that are found within that crop. And it's essentially going to give you a whole reading or a nice round sum 
of the value of that crop. So how much digestible energy is available within that crop. I really like to talk about TDN because it takes into account our fats and it takes into account our proteins. If we're talking um, like uh, RFV, that's just going to, excuse me, that's just going to be um, a calculated value of our fiber components. So if we are analyzing a forage or if we're taking a look at the relative feed value of a forage or RFV, it's important to remember that that's taking a look at the fiber components, acid detergent fiber and neutral detergent fiber. So in order to get a whole analysis of what that crop actually is in terms of its nutritive value, we really should take a look at crude protein along with RFV, which is a really common form of uh, marketing forages is either taking a look at TDN because that's also has the, the, the protein component in it, or looking at RFV along with crude protein. Yeah, good deal, good deal. Um, another question I have for you, and, and I don't know that uh, there's a lot of research behind this, but you can inform me if there is. I've seen different colors of plastic wrap. Sometimes when they wrap round bells and stuff, sometimes it's black, sometimes it's white. I've even seen pink and other stuff as well, but is there a, a reason to use one color over the other ever? Yeah, so uh, I was in Kentucky a few weeks ago talking at a conference and it seems like every time uh, I talk about round bale silage, this question comes up. It's a really curious question that folks have because there's all colors of the rainbow out there in terms of uh, uh, silage bale color wrap. And um, as far as I know, like you said, I really don't know of any research that's available. But one thing that kind of common sense, I guess, could tell us is black attracts heat. And so if we're wrapping bales in the very cool time of the year in early spring or perhaps in late fall, whenever we don't have a lot of environmental heat available, Perhaps using black plastic might help to heat up that bale a little bit to help to generate some of that fermentation process where, uh, you know, if we're wrapping hay in the cold times of the year, a lot of times we'll wrap it and it could just sit there if it perhaps freezes, especially in the fall. You know, if we're wrapping hay in the late fall, I know a couple of years ago, my dad wrapped some hay um, in the late fall and he, as he fed it throughout the winter and unwrapped it, it was like it was the day that he bailed it because it got, it turned cold, it froze, and it never really went through that fermentation process. So he used white plastic. Maybe if he used black plastic, we could have generated some of that solar energy to help uh, through the fermentation process. But yeah, that's really the only thing that uh, I can think of is maybe just helping to counteract some of those environmental temperatures, uh, maybe using white plastic if we're um, in the, the dead of summer and in those really scorching temperatures so that we can help to reduce the temperature, the internal temperature of our bales. Good deal, good deal. And uh, please join us back for part two of round bale silage. Uh, it's, it's a very important topic. It's growing. Um, definitely a lot more interest in it, um, not just from Agco, but across the industry um, as, you know, more rain showers will pop up here and there, and it gives you a little more leeway. So join us for part two, and uh, we're going to look at some forage quality, our new Massey Ferguson ProTech baler, which is a baler wrapper combo, and we'll talk about that stuff in the next episode. Thanks for joining.